Hi. Oh, we're live. Look at that. Okay, so today's lighthouse. Welcome. Make yourself at home. Uh, today's lighthouse is sponsored for the Rafua Shlema of Benachem Mendel Ben Sarabatia and Devora Fega Bat Razel. Um, I'm going to try mightily to mightily endeavor, if it's at all possible, to offend fewer people this week than we did last week. <laughs> <laughs> sorry if that's disappointing to you. I'm sorry if that's disappointing to you. Um, but yes, I, I know, I know. But I just I can't take any more of the hate, man. I just, I just can't do it. I can't do it. Um, so we're trying out, we're trying out a new mic this week. So if you're uh, if you're on my Facebook feed, not the uh, not the Lighthouse Facebook feed, but if you're on my Facebook feed, and you can tell me if uh, if you can hear well or poorly from this mic, that would be good. Like for example, I have no idea if this mute button means that it's muted or not muted. How do we know if it's flashing? Is it muted? Or if it's off? Is it muted? Don't know. Okay. It's a moot point. It's a, <laughs> it's a moot point. There's an error in your live video. What? What? Let's try that one more time. You have to notice your own light. Um, there is. The right side is probably muted. Your yes. page is live. My page is live, right? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Let's see. It says, unable to find camera. That is so weird. You're coming across here. Is that on the lot? Is that on the Facebook feed? I mean, on the uh, the light. That's my feed. Yeah. Oh, okay. So then, what's? Yeah, so why does it say I don't want to find camera? My camera's right here. Why can you not find? Oh, wow. Hey, what's going on, Lily? I don't understand why I can't. I don't understand why this isn't the. Uh, Beyond strange. Let's try to do this and see if let's see if that's any better. We'll give it one second, and if not, we're just gonna we're just gonna move on because we gotta do what we gotta do. Yeah, the other page sent the mic has sent to Dalia is online. That's not good. That is so strange. That is so strange. Wow. I don't know. I don't know, man. This is really weird. Okay, this is so. Is this one? Is this feed live on the lighthouse feed? On your page. On my page, it's live now. That can't be because I'm looking at it. Yeah, that's the beginning, but then it cuts out in like a, in, in a minute. It cuts out literally in one second. That is bizarre. This is horrible TV. <laughs> if anyone's watching, I apologize. Of course, if anyone's watching, they're immediately going to turn it off and stop watching, because it's abysmal. All right, unable to find camera, whatever. It is what it is. I'm gonna unpost this, and we're gonna, yeah, that's not gonna happen. Delete. That is so strange. That is so strange. Okay, I give up. Done. We're gonna do it on Lighthouse Feed, and that's it. Okay. Um, so tonight's tonight's class is entitled uh, "Why Your Hanukkah Is Actually Christmas." So that should be fun, and probably will hurt fewer people's feelings because we're telling them that they're celebrating a Christian holiday as opposed to a Jewish holiday. I mean, what could go wrong? Everybody loves Hanukkah. Everybody loves Hanukkah, right? First of all, it's the it's a Jewish holiday where you don't have to actually sit in a hut. And um, you don't have to eat a cardboard cracker. You don't have to wave strange palm fronds. It's nice. Who doesn't like candles? Who doesn't like candles, right? Candles are pretty, they're beautiful, they're wonderful, they're nice, they're relaxing. You buy them at Bed Bath & Beyond. It's just a whole nice vibe. And also, you have the whole Christmas thing. Who doesn't love Christmas? I'm a proud Jew. I'm a proud Jew. I love Christmas, right? Christmas is wonderful. First of all, people are nice on the subway. If you go to New York and you spend time on the subway, you will find that people are not always that civil. But the civility meter goes from here to here in this season. It really is the season to be jolly. So everyone loves Hanukkah, everyone loves Christmas. They're not, you know, they're nice. Pretty lights in the streets. If you drive down uh, Collins Avenue, you go to Bell Harbor, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. What's not to like? Great. 
I would like to relate to you a story that was told to me when I was a kid. I'm sure it was probably told to you guys as well. Uh, there was this guy named Matit Yahu, or Matis Yahu, depending upon what kind of school you went to. And um, Matis Yahu was a Kohen, and there was this Greek soldier in Judea setting up an idol or some sort of statue of like Zeus or Jupiter or whatever the local deity was. And Matis Yahu says, oh, me la Shem Eli. Those were his big three words, right? Me la Shem Eli, which means whoever is for God to me. And then he started a rebellion. He stabs the Greek soldier and he starts a rebellion and these, these, these poor, poorly armed ragtag group of Jews is able to conquer the Greek army. Now just to take a moment to pause and understand the significance of this, we're not talking about people that have stinger missiles that they get from the CIA to shoot down Russian helicopters. We're talking, and, and you know, we picture Maccabees. They're Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? They're like these Jewish guys. They have a yarmulke and a Jewish star, but they're very muscular. They're, no. No, probably not an accurate depiction of what the Maccabean looked like. They probably looked like me, only bearded and a little balder and a little fatter. Like that's, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they weren't fatter. I wasn't gonna say, but now that you bring it up, yes, like you. Um, yeah, th that's what they looked like. These, were, these guys were in the Beit Midrash all the time. These guys were Kohanim. So they were always learning and studying. They weren't, you know, big burly guys and God made a big miracle and they were able to win. And hallelujah for God, it was such a nice thing. You know, sababa shalom. Three years. The, the war? No, independence. You're saying it lasted three years. Oh, well, we'll see. We're, we're, we're going to talk about this. So, and, and they were able to beat up, you know, the big bad Greeks, and, and that's wonderful. Now, to me, this is actually quite disturbing. And I would like, I would like to, to, to share with you why this is disturbing, because I live in 2017. So when I hear, when I hear, when I was a kid, it sounded great. It was wonderful. Yay, me la shemi lai, right? Whoever's for God, come to me. It sounds like a great thing. In 2017, when you hear, can you imagine someone going, ah, la, 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 la. <laughs> not, not what you're looking for from a religion. You don't want to hear people screaming out foreign words like, whoever is for God, and then you know that the next word isn't a word, it's a boom. You know that, all, that, that people are going to die. It sounds like religious fanaticism. That's what it sounds like. This, this sounds like the Hebrew equivalent of Allahu Akbar. And, and I, I don't care if you are a, a conservative or a liberal, a Republican, a Democrat, a Libertarian, an atheist, a Jew, a Mormon, a Buddhist. It doesn't make a difference. If you are on an airplane and you hear someone scream at the top of his lungs, Allahu Akbar, I promise you, you just peed your pants. And that's the truth. And that's the truth. And if you feel righteously indignant about what I just said, then you're really lying to yourself and everybody else. Give me a break. You know the context, right? You, you read the news. So when people scream religious things before they stab people, that's disturbing to me. I'm not comfortable with that. And I think we should probably deal with that, frankly. I think we should confront it head on. We should look it dead in the eye. We should decide whether we think it's a good idea or a bad idea. That's just my thing. Again, feel free to hang up the phone. As we know, half the feed's already off anyway, so <laughs> it's, it's much even easier to, uh, to get rid of the feed. Lefein, lefein. So I would like to quote my favorite atheist. This is my personal favorite atheist, Christopher, Hillen, uh, Chris, <laughs> Christopher Hitchens. Allah HaShalom, blessed memory. He was far and away my favoriteest, favoriteest, favoriteest atheist. He is the, uh, the author of uh, of God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, which is a great book. I think it's, it's recommended reading for everybody, especially for religious people. You should read that book. It's important. Um, I would like to quote one of his great articles about Hanukkah. He writes this article. Instead of Bah Humbug, it's called Bah Hanukkah, and I would like to talk to you a little bit about what he says about Hanukkah. So, and I quote, Jewish Orthodoxy possesses the interesting feature of naming and combating the idea of the Apikores, or Epicurean, the intellectual renegade who prefers Athens to Jerusalem and the schools of philosophy to the grim old routines of the Torah. About a century and a half before the alleged birth of the supposed Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth another event that received semi-official recognition at this time of year, you may be aware, the Greek or Epicurean style had begun to gain immense ground among the Jews of Syria and Palestine. 
The Seleucid Empire, an inheritance of Alexander the Great, had weaned many people away from the sacrifices, the circumcisions, the belief in a special relationship with God, and the other reactionary manifestations of an ancient and cruel faith. But the Hasmonean regime, this refers to the Maccabean, the Hasmonean regime that resulted from the Maccabean revolt soon became exorbitantly corrupt, vicious and divided, and encouraged the Roman annexation of Judea. Now listen to this, this is my favorite part. Had it not been for this event, we would never have had to hear of Jesus of Nazareth or his sect, which was a plagiarism from fundamentalist Judaism, and the Jewish people would never have been accused of being deicidal Christ killers. Thus, to celebrate Hanukkah is to celebrate not just the triumph of tribal Jewish backwardness, but also the accidental birth of Judaism's bastard child in the shape of Christianity. You might think that masochism could do no more except that it always can. Without the precedence of Orthodox Judaism and Roman Christianity, on which it is based and from which it is borrowed, there would be no Islam either. Every Jew who honors the Hanukkah holiday because it gives his child an excuse to mingle the dreidel with the Christmas tree and the sleigh, neither of these absurd symbols having the least thing to do with Palestine two millennia past, is celebrating the making of a series of rods for his own back. And this is not just a disaster for the Jews. When the fanatics of Palestine won that victory, and when Judaism repudiated Athens for Jerusalem, the development of the whole of humanity was terribly retarded. And of course, and as ever, one stands aghast at the pathetic scale of the supposed miracle. As a consequence of the successful Maccabean revolt against Hellenism, so it is said, a puddle of oil that should have lasted only for one day managed to burn for eight days. Wow! Certain proof, not just of an almighty, but of an almighty with a special fondness for fundamentalists. Epicurus and Democritus has brilliantly discovered that the world was made up of atoms, but who cares about a mere fact like that when there's miraculous oil to be goggled at by credulous peasants? We are about to have the annual culture war about the display of cribs, mangers, conifers, and other symbols on public land. Most of this argument is phony and tawdry and secondhand. It has nothing to do whatever with faith as its protagonists understand it. The burning of a Yule log or the display of a Scandinavian tree is nothing more than paganism and the observance of a winter solstice. It makes no more acknowledgement of the Christian religion than I do, I being Christopher Hitchens. The he was named after him. Right, which is true, even though he was Jewish, which is also fascinating. The was fierce point. What? No, Christopher Hitchens was. Yes, he was. His father was Episcopalian, his mother was Jewish. Yes, 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 Christopher. Uh, the, I actually have a Jewish friend, Christopher. Um, Chris, Chris Cook, I hope he's watching. The fierce partisanship of the Hollybush and mistletoe believers convicts them of nothing more than ignorance and simple-mindedness. They would have been just as pious under the reigns of the Druids or the Vikings, and just as much attached to their icons. Everybody knows, furthermore, that there was no star moving the east, etc., etc., etc. We don't have to talk about that. But, so what's his big problem? The child is, this is childish stuff. And if only for that reason should obviously not receive any public endorsement or funding. The display of the menorah at this season, however, has a precise meaning and is an explicit celebration of the original victory of bloody-minded faith over enlightenment and reason. As such, it is direct negation of the First Amendment and it is time for the secularists and the civil libertarians to find the courage to say so. I love this guy. This guy is amazing. So Hitchens hates Hanukkah. He hates Hanukkah. Because in Hanukkah, the Jews chose Jerusalem over Athens and thereby launched Judaism, fundamentalist Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, damning the world to thousands and thousands of years of strife and crusades and jihad and whatever else you want to call them. They're all the same. Okay? That's Hitchens' idea. Fantastic. So basically, in a nutshell, Christmas is bad enough because it's fake, again, according to Hitchens, but Hanukkah is much worse. Because a bunch of fanatics. The truth is, though, Christmas isn't, isn't much of a breeze either. Because the same way that the Jew in 2017 can look at Hanukkah and say, one second, am I some kind of bloody fundamentalist? Am I, a, am I an extremist? Am I a terrorist? And, and, and sort of feel like a little bit messed inside, a little, a little internal turmoil there. Um, yeah, but the Christian has to look back at his holiday of Christmas and be like, am, am I a pagan? Do I celebrate Saturnalia? Is this like the winter solstice feast? Is this the hero's gamos orgy? Like what? It, it, it's a little disturbing to them too. But don't worry. Don't worry. Cause commercialism. Baruch Hashem. 
See, we can make our holidays devoid of any religious meaning whatsoever. It's not a problem. So Christmas can be, instead of about Jesus and the birth of Jesus, we can make, we can make Christmas about sales and parades and music and movies and decorations and the radio stations, and it'll be wonderful. So, you know, forget about the holiday and just, you know, kind of like morph it into something that you like today. It's very convenient, right? That, that's not a problem. Um, this is why, incidentally, this idea that you can take holidays and sort of like twist them into whatever you want, this is why most Americans will tell you that over the holidays, be sure to avoid topics like politics or religion. Because when you're sitting around the table with your family, you want to be very, very sure to avoid any topic that might actually be very meaningful to the person who's talking about it. You want to avoid that at all cost. Okay, fine, fine. That doesn't work with Judaism. It doesn't work. Why not? So the problem with Judaism, Judaism doesn't have the same kind of holidays. That's not how Jews do holidays. Jews do not commemorate events. We don't. I know people think we do. I'm aware. We don't. Why don't we commemorate events? Because why would you commemorate an event? Did you know that 8,000 years ago something happened to someone? Well, hey, let's eat a jelly donut. That's great. Something happened to someone in a place at a time. I believe the term in Yiddish is no me importa. Who cares? Who play cares? That's not what Jews are doing. Jews do not commemorate events. Jews don't have holidays. They don't have holidays in that way. What Jews have are exercises. Jews have exercises. Here's, here's what I mean by that. Every Jewish holiday has a specific commandment of the day, a mitzvah. Hayom. They have exercises. They have certain very, very specified actions that you have to do on that holiday. So, for example, on Passover, you don't sit in a booth, and on Sukkot, you don't eat a wafer. You don't sit at the Passover Seder and read the Megillah, and you don't wave a lulav on Hanukkah. Every single holiday has specific actions that are indigenous to that experience. Now, I'm not, I'm not judging, because other faiths can do whatever they want, and that's fine. But you understand that they don't prescribe specific actions that have any connection to the holiday, okay? Like, you have to understand, Jesus was not a fat man in a red suit, nor was he a seven-foot bunny. So, not judging, it's fine. You do whatever you want with your holidays, but that's not how Jews do holidays. We do it very, very differently. We, we celebrate by doing prescribed actions that are supposed to give us an idea. They're supposed to give us an experience that we can relive it doesn't matter if great-great-grandpa Arnold had something happen to him in a place. I am going through the same thing that Grandpa Arnold went through on Passover. That's the idea. The idea is that all of us are experiencing the exact same thing that our ancestors experienced. It's not a, it's not a this happened and therefore I'm going to talk about it. It's happening today. It's happening now. And if that's the case, then the same is true by Hanukkah. You have to be not, not commemorating something, but reliving something. Reliving something. Well, if you're reliving it, how do you feel about reliving extremism? How do you, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about, you ever gone to um, Bar Ilan Street on, uh, on Shabbat and you see those people like throwing rocks at the, at the cars on Shabbos? It's unbelievable. They're, they're, very, they're very concerned with the honor of Shabbat. And how do you show, how do you demonstrate the honor of Shabbat? Simple, by throwing rocks at cars. Everybody knows that. There could be nothing you can do that would be a higher, a higher, in more esteemed way to honor the Shabbat than throwing rocks at people who happen to drive on Saturday. How do you feel about that? I'll tell you how I feel. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. I'll tell you how I feel. I feel nauseous. I feel disgusted. I feel like it's pathetic. I feel disdain. I feel despair. I don't know if I'm angrier or sadder about it, but either way, it's despicable. So, how how do you feel about spitting on Israeli soldiers? I feel the exact same way about that. Exact same way. And yet, we're supposed to be reliving Hanukkah. So we should probably take a few moments to understand what exactly is happening on Hanukkah and what it is that we're reliving. Let's try to understand this. So, with that in mind, let's begin. Hanukkah is celebrating a massive miracle, right? A massive miracle, like the immortal Hitchin said, because a puddle of oil lasted for eight days. 
Great. Now that's a very big miracle. If you could take this much Diet Coke and make it last for Shlomo for eight days, that would be a miracle. This would not last Shlomo eight minutes. That would be a very big miracle, right? Wonderful. I would posit to you that it's, and, and I'm sorry for saying so, and I know I'm gonna get flack for this, but it's okay because I'm only gonna get a third of the flack because most of the people aren't watching. Um, it's the stupidest miracle ever. It's the stupidest miracle ever. Why? Why? Tell me. Tell me why you think I think it's the stupidest miracle ever. Well, I try to sign once more into the Facebook. Just give me one more shot on the other feed. Why do you think I think it's the stupidest miracle ever? Come on, don't be bashful. Tell me what you think. I know you're not bashful. Miracle of little oil. What are you doing? You're not helping anybody with this. It's, it's insane. It's insane. Who are you helping? Who are you helping? This is much crazy. Who are you helping by doing this miracle? No, seriously, tell me. What are, what are you doing? What are you doing? Tell me. Do we, well, we need to, we need to light the menorah in the temple. It's very important. The Jews can't function as a nation if we don't light this candle. False. False. Not true. Not true. Not true. Not true according to fundamentalist extremist Haredi Jews. Each and every one of them will tell you that there is a rule called Tuma Hutra Bitsibor. Which means that if everyone is impure, no one is impure. And if all of the oil is impure, none of the oil is impure. Imagine that. Well, they oh, we found this one little jug. Baruch Hashem. We found this one little jug with enough oil to last for one day. You didn't need the oil. It's not a problem. Take all the defiled oil. You can light it up in the, in the menorah. It's not a problem, halakhically. No problem at all. So you're telling me that God is shattering the laws of physics in order to help people with their electric bill? <laughs> it's crazy. It's the stupidest miracle ever. And if you look at all the other miracles that we celebrate, again, whatever you, whatever you happen to think about the miracles, they did happen, they didn't happen, I believe it, I didn't believe it, it's literal, it's a metaphor, I don't care. But the point is you have to at least appreciate and understand that on Passover, God saved our lives, that's significant. On Sukkot, we had houses, that's significant. On Purim, he saved our lives, that's significant. The saving of lives is significant. FPNL giving you a discount is not significant, it's insignificant. So for God to do such a massive miracle, I'm mean, like, why? That's a re it's a real head scratcher. At least celebrate like the victory. So we should celebrate the victory over the Greeks, right? If a, if a few little weak Jews with, oy, right, with, with back aches and long beards were able to defeat the great Greek army, that's a big miracle. Okay, that, I, I'll grant you that, right? That, that's a great miracle. We should celebrate that. We never celebrate, we never celebrate victories in Judaism. We never celebrate victories in Judaism. Look at Tanakh. I mean, there's, there's a bajillion examples, right? We, I mean, we don't celebrate impossible military victories in Samson, Samuel, Saul. Those are just three S's, right? That's like not counting uh, Gidon or David or anybody else. Hmm? Or maybe it happened. That's why we don't... Uh... Well, we did. No, we did beat the Greeks. That's historically, right? We know that happened. That can't be debated. We can debate whether or not oil lasted, but we can't debate whether or not we beat the Greeks because we did. Right? We did. We know that. It's externally substantiated. There's no doubt that we beat the Greeks. But there are, I'm saying, even other military victories that we know we had, because we're around and they're not. We, we never celebrate military victories, which would be why we don't celebrate this military victory either. Fine. But, but why would you celebrate this, this, this loyal thing? I mean, it's a very unimpressive miracle, frankly. But how would you commemorate, like, beating of an army? Like you can commemorate like not having bread. But like oh, oh, I love it. With fireworks, like we do on July 4th. We beat the British. Fireworks, go to the beach and have a barbecue. Right? Fireworks. Fireworks, do something, I don't know. Eat. How do we commemorate everything? We eat. We eat a lot. We, we eat a whole heck of a lot. Yeah? We do these things. So, oh, I wonder if I can. Isn't that tantamount to the same thing? Why do we the fireworks? And display them in the windows of the rest of the world? Um, say this again? Is it a tantamount mm -hmm. to the same thing as fireworks? 
Oh, you're right. saying fire, we are celebrating by, by, by using right. fireworks and that we're doing this and that. Oh, that's interesting. That's a, right. We're kind of doing our fireworks, medieval fireworks. That's true. Um, but we seem to be doing this whole oil thing, right? We do talk about this oil miracle. There's, you, you know, also the, the, the independence did not last very long at all. The Jewish independence from foreign nations, when they were able to throw off the yoke of the Greeks, when they were able to cast them off and be independent, it, it, it did not last long. Within a few generations, um, they were right back under the boot of, instead of Greece, Rome, right? They were under the boot of Rome very, very soon afterwards. Um, and furthermore, the Maccabees themselves became Hellenized. They became Greek. They became the perpetrators, the ones who were the heroes the ones who were the heroes, I'm getting calls now on my phone, everybody's flipping out, oh man. I'm gonna get so much flack for this, no, please. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the camera's not working on my computer. It's unable to find the camera, I'm sorry. Send us stuff, send us stuff on the um, Yeah, I, could, I suppose I could do that, but they're watching on this. I'll just, I'm just gonna take this feed and I'm gonna click it off to the other one uh, subsequently and, and it'll, be, it'll be what it'll be. So. So it's a very strange thing. The point is it's a very weird thing to commemorate, this whole oil business. It's very weird to commemorate. And there's one more thing that makes it even weirder to commemorate. You'll notice that it is, to the best of my knowledge, the only mitzvah, the only one of its kind, in that the mitzvah of Hanukkah, how do we light? According to the mitzvah, what is the mitzvah to light on Hanukkah? According to the Talmud, one candle per household. That's the mitzvah. Ner ish uveto. A candle for a man and his household. Ule mehadrin, to those who want to take the mitzvah one step further and beautify it. Ner lekol echad veechad. A candle for everyone in the household. And then, mehadrin, min ha mehadrin, the beauty of the beautiful is that we light, start with one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five, and then six, and then seven, and then eight. Poof! Great. Wonderful. Now, we are used to this idea because we grew up with this. You grew up with this, and you grew up with this, and you, and I, and everyone grew up with this, right? We had a little, we light the candles. Very nice. Baruch Hashem. Marvelous. You know what the problem is? It doesn't make sense. If I were to tell you, what's the mitzvah? Everyone has to eat on Pesach, you have to eat a kezayit, the volume of an olive of matzah. But if you're mehadrin, you have to eat six kezayit of matzah. And if you're mehadrin, mina mehadrin, then you have to eat 14 matzahs and a bison and a turkey leg. You, you, that's a head scratcher. What are you talking about? This is not something that we do. This is not something that we do. Was it something I said? It's usually something I said. <laughs> Right? The, where, where do you find this? Where do you find this? You find it, by the way, by kashrut, by like kosher things. Like, well, this is kosher, but you know, I'm very particular. I'm a hadrin. Or, uh, okay, good for you. Uh, <laughs> this, this is a mitzvah. You don't have a mitzvah of if you have a lula. If you have a lula. You know what mahadrin generally means? A more beautiful mitzvah. So you could buy an etrog. You could buy an etrog. And then if it's a mehadrin etrog, it's a more beautiful esrog, good for you. A more beautiful lulav, a more beautiful sukkah, a nicer suit for Shabbat. More expensive, of course, right? Because the rabbis, they need to make more money, so they make a bigger mitzvah. <laughs> but, but you don't have like, you don't have the two esrogim. If you come to shul on Sukkot with three etrogs and you're juggling them like this on, during the hakafot, does that make you, uh, ah, I'm very from, right? I, I have two etrogs. That doesn't make you mahadrin, that makes you an idiot. So why all of a sudden, why all of a sudden um, by, by this, uh, by, by Hanukkah, you have this Mahajan business. It's very, very weird. Okay, so let's keep all those ideas kind of in the back of our head. Let's keep those ideas in the back of our head and let's try to understand what exactly it is that we're celebrating. So you see, there is a, there is a feature that every holiday has which gives you a hint as to what the holiday is. For example, why do we call Pesach, Pesach? It's the same in the English because Pesach means Passover. God passed over our houses. He passed over us, he killed the Egyptians. It is the feature of the holiday. On Sukkot, it's called booths. Why? Because you sit in a booth. God put you in a booth. You would have been outside in the desert with nothing, with no shelter. God put you in booths. Very nice. 
Purim, it's about lots, right? Every holiday, the name of the holiday is indicative of what the holiday is, which is very intuitive. It's very intuitive. What does uh, Hanukkah mean? What does Hanukkah mean? Oh, so I know what it means, right? I know what it means. You're going to love this one. You know what Hanukkah means? Hanukkah means Hanu Chaf He. You heard this? It's great. Hanukkah, if you look at the word Hanukkah, it's, it's Hanu, they encamped, Chaf He on the 25th. They encamped on the 25th of the month of Kislev because the month of Kislev is when, they, is when they were able to win and they rested on the 25th of Kislev and that's why they called the holiday Hanukkah. You've never heard this before? You've heard this before. Unbelievable. I admit that it's very clever and it's a nice way to remember what day it comes out on, but if you think that that's why they called it Hanukkah, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. I mean, you're crazy if you think, no, that's not true. You're not crazy. You're, you're, just, you're just very ignorant. If you think that that's why they called it Hanukkah. First of all, because the word encamp does not mean to rest. In fact, many times when you go to war, you would say the word Hanu, they encamped. Because you encamp when you're at war. So that's obviously not what that means, number one. Number two, no, it doesn't even say that it's Kislev. That's not what it means. The word Hanukkah has a meaning. Tell me something. What does the word Chinuch mean? Hanukkah is chinuch. What does the word chinuch mean? Teach. To teach. Right? To educate. Beautiful. Educating. We talk about teaching kids. We say, chinuch. To be mechanech. A teacher is a mechanech. Very nice. Wonderful. There's a word. So it's education. We called, we called the holiday education? Why do we call the holiday education? <laughs> this is strange. That's a strange thing. Let me give you some examples of where we find this. It says, uh, for example, chinuch lena'ar al pi darko. Educate a child, Hanoch Lenar, educate a child, Al Pidarko, in accordance with his or her way. Okay. Uh, another one would be by Avraham Avinu. It says, when he went to fight the, the four kings in Parshat Lechacha, Fayarek et Chanichav Yilidei Beto. He mustered up Chanichav, his, the ones that he had educated, his students. Right? It wasn't referring to his sons because he didn't have any children. So the people of his household were his students as opposed to his biological children, and therefore it's Chanichav. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, it, it, it's a strange, it's a strange thing to call a holiday. But if you look in the Torah, the Torah says Zot. And please translate for me. I know that we have at least one Hebrew speaker, probably two, and maybe even four. Um, Zot Chanukat Hamizbeach Biyom Himashach Oto Meet Nisiye Israel. Zot Chanukat Hamizbeach. The grand opening. The grand opening. The grand opening. This is the grand opening of the altar. When in the Torah, when the Torah describes. The, the inauguration of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle, the moving temple in the desert that accompanied the Jews for 40 years. When the whole thing had been finished, it had been completed, and all the building was in, and all the monies were in, and all the building was finished, and it was put together and erected, it says, Zot Chanukat HaMizbeach. But I don't understand. You just said it's the education. You're saying it's the education of the Mizbeach. It's the education of the altar. The altar is where they used to bring the sacrifices, right? So it's like this big, imagine it like a big barbecue grill because that's kind of what it was. It's a big barbecue grill with a ramp on it, except it's a very expensive barbecue grill. It's like a, it's like a, uh, a Weber times a million. Why, how, how do you have an education of, of the altar? You don't educate an altar. An altar is a, is a hunk of metal or a hunk of stone. Like you can start using it. You can start using it, that's true, right? Which is what Rotem was saying, right? It's the grand opening. Why would the word for grand opening and the word for education be the same? Teach the next generation to ask. So it's it, so it's called it's called Chanukat Hamizbeach the the education of the altar because you have to teach the next generation how to use the altar because there is no mikdash anymore. Mm -hmm. We had to come up with something. How do we keep the tradition? The people. No, but I'm talking in the Torah when it says it. When the Torah says Zot Chanukat Hamizbeach, because that's a pasuk from Parshat Maso over here. It's very strange. The truth is, it's because I lied to you. Because Chinuch does not mean education. I lied. It's okay. Only half the people are watching. It's fine. I can lie. Chinuch does not mean education. I know, right? We say it does all the time. Getting these looks. How could you say it doesn't mean that? It doesn't mean that. You know what it means? Dedication. The word chinuch means dedication. The word chanukah means dedication. Not education. It means dedication. Now, we'll, we'll have to... We'll have to explain how that relates to educating children. That seems like a very, very strange thing to, to say. So it says it's the dedication of the altar. Of the what? 
well, ultimately of the lights, yeah. So they, they dedicated in the Torah primarily, the primary source of the word Hanukkah is in the Torah. It's not, a, it's not a, an invention of the Maccabees 2,000 years later. It's in the Torah, primary source, the book. It's dedication. Many people make the mistake of thinking that dedication means sacrifice. You know how dedicated he is? He's there at five in the morning and he's there till late at night. He's very dedicated, right? Dedicated means sacrifice. That's not true. That is not true. Um, for a sacrifice is sometimes an indication of dedication, but it's not synonymous with dedication. Dedication is a statement of existential identity. When you are dedicated to something, that is a statement of connection between your identity and the concept. If I'm dedicated to healing the sick, I'm saying that my life is about healing the sick. That's why I am here. I'm dedicated to it. That's what dedication means. Hence, when it says, Chanoch l'na'ar al darko, dedicate a child. It's referring to education. Dedicate a child. If dedication is your existential identity, what we are going to literally push you and click you into for the rest of your life, Dedicate a child in his way, in her way, not in your way, and not in the way that you want him to be. You can't do that. It doesn't work. Because if, my, if I dedicate my life to healing the sick, because that's what I'm about, then if you were to take me out of that and put me in the NBA, I would be miserable and probably not very good on the court. You have to dedicate children in their way. In their way. Now, obviously, that coincides with education. Because that's how you show someone what they are. Education isn't about taking facts from a book and sticking it into someone's head. That's not what education is. Education is about opening up their mind. That's what education is. So the word to educate in Hebrew is lilameid, not lechanech. Lechanech is a deeper reality than to teach. It means to dedicate. So we dedicate an altar, but it's still a, it's still a very strange word because you, you should say like inaugurate an altar, like you said, grand opening of the altar, maiden voyage of the altar. Why 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 dedicate the altar? I'll, I'll tell you why we dedicate the altar. Because if you don't dedicate the altar, you know what it is. You don't like this. It's an idol. If you don't dedicate and articulate exactly, precisely, concisely what the altar is and is not, then it's whatever you want it to be. And if it's whatever you want it to be, it's a golden calf. It's your idol. So therefore, you have to dedicate it when you start it. You have to say, this is what this is. These are the parameters of this idea and only these parameters and nothing outside of these parameters. And if it ever exits from these parameters, it's something else and it is to be broken down. Because it's no longer the purpose that it was dedicated for and towards. Well, hmm. That means that if you remove, if you remove specific dedication from a holiday, it could be Jesus' birthday, or a magic tree, or a harvest festival, or a flying fat man in a red suit, or a nice mail with the family, or a retail holiday. It's whatever you want it to be. Because it's not dedicated to anything. It's a holiday. Do with it what you want. You want to sit down and watch football? Great. You want to go to the mall? Great. You want to hang out with your friends? Fine. You want to have a family meal with a, with a, a pig with a, you know, a, an apple in the mouth? Fine. You want to go to mass? Fine. It's not dedicated to anything. It's whatever you want. It's whatever you want it to be. Now, this is, you know, it, it's funny because you know what happens to a generation that doesn't dedicate anything? Two words. Your truth. It's great. All right, there's no dedications. It's whatever true for you today, right? So today, this is my truth, and tomorrow, that's my truth, and you know, it could be really whatever you like. So the point is that Hanukkah is the dedication of the temple for a very specific purpose. Very specific purpose. Now let's pause that for a moment. Let's go back in time. Let's go all the way back in time to the progenitor, to the father of our nation, to Abraham. Abraham is told about the exiles that his children will have to go through. 
And the way that the Torah puts it is vihine eima chashecha gedola nofelet alav. He uses four words to describe the terrible travails that his children, we, are going to experience. The first one is eima, which is fear. And the second is chashecha. Chashecha, which means darkness. And the Talmud teaches us, you know which exile darkness is talking about? The Greeks. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. So God is telling Avraham a thousand years before it happens that his children are going to have an exile. Very, very interesting exile, by the way, in that they were in the land when it happened. Exile has nothing to do with geography. Exile has to do with mentality. Your children are going to be exiled. And the exile that you had under Rome is not the same exile that you had under Greece. And it's not the same feeling of the exile that you had in Egypt. They're all different. They have different personalities and therefore they are used in different words. So the word that is used to describe the Greek, the Greek exile is chashecha, darkness. What's the opposite of darkness? Light. Light. Why darkness? Because it was in the oil. It wasn't any oil, right? But the oil, the oil, the light, is symbolic of much more than light. No one cares about the light. You can light with oil that's not pure. That's not a big deal. That's not the light that we're referring to. We're referring to the light of the Torah. We're referring to the light of our Judaism. You know, sometimes when we say dark and light in metaphors, we mean good and evil. Other times we mean Information. The Dark Ages had nothing to do with, with good and evil. It had to do with people being illiterate. There was 99% illiteracy. We call it the Dark Ages. Light refers to information and understanding. In the, in the temple, the vessel that deals with Torah, that is symbolic of Torah, is the menorah. Because it lights your eyes. It shows you where to go. It teaches you things. That is your light. Well... Well, why are we celebrating? I'll tell you why. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. We asked the question. We said, this seems like a very, Mi la shemi lai. It sounds like Allahu Akbar. It sounds like you're about to do a fanatic extremist terrorism uh, on, on, on some soldier in the middle of nowhere. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You're not, Mi la shemi lai does not mean, oh, God is great. Let me sacrifice this man to God. That's what you're doing, right? When you scream God's name and then murder somebody, you are doing human sacrifice. That's what human sacrifice is. I hereby sacrifice this person to God. So it doesn't matter if you're an Aztec or if you're an Inca, uh, an Incan, or if you're uh, a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian. It's all the same thing. You're sacrificing this person to God by murdering him. That, that wasn't the Jewish battle cry. The Jewish cry was, whoever is for God, come to me. Mi la shemilai. Who are you? Hanukkah was a civil war. We don't think of it that way. We think of Hanukkah. We are taught in our schools, in our day schools, that Hanukkah was a war of the Jews against the Greeks. And that is only very somewhat true. Somewhat true. It misses the whole point. It wasn't about the Jews and the Greeks. The Greeks only came because they were invited. They were asked to help. They were asked to help crush the Jews, the religious Jews, by who? By the Hellenized Jews. There were many Jews that didn't want to be Jewish anymore, and they asked the Greek army to come in and help them destroy the old Jews. Not old age-wise, but old theologically. And the Greeks were all too happy to help. And therefore, and therefore, their sign was, whoever is for God, come to me. See, Hitchens doesn't like the fact that, that the Jews, the Maccabees, were victorious over the Greeks because we set history back a thousand years. Well, more, more. It's still back, according to him, with all these religions, right? And, and I agree with him. I think that religion can often be, and usually is, a terrible, terrible thing. But you know what's it? equally bad to religion, if not worse? Religious oppression. The Jews of the time, the Maccabees, weren't running around killing Jews who didn't keep Shabbat. They weren't running around murdering Jews who drove down Ben Yehuda Street or drove down Bar Ilan Street. They weren't murdering Jews who didn't want to who didn't want to go and study Torah. That's not what they were doing. The Greeks at the time said, "We're not going to let you learn Torah. We're not going to let you be Jewish." I'm not a Zoroastrian. I know that's shocking for you to hear, but I'm not a Zoroastrian. 
I will march with the Zoroastrians if you try to take away their right to be Zoroastrian. I'm not a Christian. I will march with the Christians if you try to take away their right to be Christian. I am not a Muslim. I will march with the Muslims if you try to take away their right to be Muslim. I will march. I don't know if I'll fight. I'm not as courageous as they were. But I'll march. I'll walk. I'll pick it. I'll stand in the heat. I'll bring a fan. You can't take away religion from people. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. Do what you like. Don't do what you don't like. You're going to tell me that I'm not allowed to keep Shabbat. For that, for that, I'll pull out the knife. That's why they rebelled. You'll notice, if you look through Jewish history, Jews were vassals to kingdoms many, many times, and they didn't revolt. Why did they rebel? Because the other kingdoms, Alexander, who was the emperor before Antioch IV, Alexander let the Jews do whatever they want. Okay, pay your tribute. Here's your money. No problem. Make it rain. You're going to tell me I can't keep Shabbat? You're going to tell me I can't be circumcised? I'll kill you with my teeth if I have to. That's what it is. Why? Because this is my identity. This is who I am. This is what I am. This is what I'm dedicated to. The reason that they call this holiday dedication, this is the holiday of identity. This is the time that the Jews, why, why is it that they were darkened, their eyes were darkened? Because it's the only holiday that we have where the Jews on the inside were the antagonists, couldn't see their own identity. All the other holidays have one thing in common, they tried to kill us. That's usually the Jewish holiday, right? They tried to kill us, we want them to see, that's the Jewish holiday. This is not that way. That is not what this holiday is. This holiday is the Jew next door, my brother, my brother was trying to take away my Shabbat. They darkened, they blinded the eyes of the Jews. They took away their Torah. And therefore we celebrate it with light. And not only do we celebrate it with light, we celebrate it in such a way that all of the halachot, all of the laws that surround Hanukkah have to do with when can you light the candles? Well, it has to be before people are gone from the streets. Why? Because they have to see it. Why? Because it's a flag of my identity. The whole purpose of Hanukkah is to wave a flag and stick up a candle and say, I am this and I'm proud to be this. I'm proud to be Jewish. I'm proud of my heritage. I'm proud of my identity. I love my identity. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. And that's the lowest level. The higher level is how many of you are in the house? How many of you are proud? And an even higher level still is when you take your identity and grow it every day. Make it bigger. It's the only mitzvah that you find that with. Because it's about a show of identity. So Christopher Hitchens, and again, I love him, he's dead wrong. I'm not telling you you can't be secular. I'm not telling you you can't study philosophy. I'm not telling you you have to be a religious Jew. But he himself would agree that even though he thinks religion is ridiculous, you can't take it away from people. Who are you? Who are you to tell me what I'm not allowed to believe? I'll believe whatever I want, thank you very much. Now, I agree that my right to wave around my fists ends when your face begins. I agree with that, I'm a libertarian. But please do not tell me that I can't wave my fists around in my own living room, because I will, and I can, and I'll continue to. That's what Hanukkah is about, Hanukkah is about dedication. That's interesting. So, what, what, what are we celebrating? Right? We're celebrating the things that, by any account, by any account, were too small, too few and too weak to last, did last. They did last. It's not about the oil. Oil doesn't matter. The oil's incidental. The oil's anecdotal. That's not what it's about. It's that we're here. We stood up. We stood up and said, no, we're not going to ride off into the limelight like everybody. We're not going to ride off into the distance, close it, roll the credits. Mm -mm -mm, not going to happen. And you know what didn't last? The Greeks. The Seleucid Empire didn't last. You know what did? Jerusalem. Just ask anybody. Especially today. And even after all this time, they're still pissed about it. Happy Hanukkah. Oh! What happened to the Exodus? Let me pull it together. <laughs> pull it together. You keep me honest, and I like that. Yes.
appreciate it. Be looking some rabbit. Did well, yeah. You and uh, what was his name? Not Nelson. Uh, who's the guy right? No, Nader. That's the name. Nader. Yeah, yeah. You gotta keep the companies honest. Okay. So uh, let's let's sum up like this. If you light Hanukkah candles because you believe that God could make a little bit of oil last for a long time, you're crazy. What's the big deal? Who cares? Who cares? And if you light Hanukkah candles, because your father did, you're celebrating Christmas. They have a tree, you have a lamp. Make a bunny, make it Easter. I love bunnies, I love chocolate, I love eggs. The celebration of Hanukkah is about the dedication of Jewish identity. Who are you, what are you, and why does it matter? And if we don't have answers to those questions, we're not celebrating Hanukkah. We're celebrating Christmas. Peace and love. <laughs>